Hi, this is Mark Middleberg, and I'm with you here coming from CCN, and we're at the live broadcast of the Great Resurrection Debate. We're broadcasting from Bethel College in northern Indiana, and right behind me is the auditorium where we're going to go live to the debate in just a couple of minutes. But I just want to say we're thrilled to have churches from all over North America, up in Canada, all the way to Florida and California, everywhere in between. We've got over 2,000 churches that we're broadcasting to today, and we're so glad that you've joined us. You know, I cannot think of a more important topic for us to be discussing today, especially during this Easter season, than this question of the evidence for or against the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, many people feel that this is the pivotal issue on which historic Christianity rises or falls. It's been called the linchpin of Christianity, the cornerstone or the epicenter of the faith. Dr. Terry Meathy says it like this. He says, this is the most important question regarding the claims of the Christian faith. But while many Christians sort of assume that Jesus really raised from the dead, the National uh, Religious News Service reports that the leaders of the group called the Jesus Seminar in recent times have concluded, quote, that there is no evidence for the Easter resurrection or that it was a physical reality. And they say that the story of the historical Jesus ended with his death on the cross and the decay of his body. John Dominic Crossan, a scholar at DePaul University in Chicago, goes even further and says that the tomb of Jesus was empty because his body was already being devoured by wild dogs. Well, these are serious charges, and according to theologian Gerald O'Collins, he says, in a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity without its final chapter. It's not Christianity at all. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still under condemnation for your sins. If we have hope in Christ only in this life, we are the most miserable people in the world. So again, obviously, this is a vitally important issue. Did Jesus really rise from the dead or not? And as you can guess, there are strong opinions on both sides, and we're going to hear two of those opinions tonight. So I just want to challenge you. Really engage your mind. Listen and weigh what you hear, and then apply it in your life in the days ahead. Now, before we go into the debate and begin formally, let me just give you a little overview of the schedule. Uh, midway through, we're going to take a short stretch break. Now, don't try to go real far because it's going to be real quick, but it's a chance at least to stand up and stretch. During that time, if you'd like to fax or email questions, you can do that and try to get those in by the end of that break. And then during a short Q&A time, we'll ask our two debaters to respond to the most asked questions. Now, I'll be back again at the very end to close out our debate, so hold on for that, and I'll tell you about how you can get a DVD of tonight's broadcast at that time. Now, our moderator for tonight's debate is Dr. David Aikman. Dr. Aikman has a, an, an incredible career. He's an award-winning print and broadcast journalist who worked for 23 years with the Time magazine uh, organization, and during that time covered almost all the major events happening around the globe. He's also a, an author of numerous books, and he is the foreign policy consultant in a firm based in Washington, D.C. We are so honored to have Dr. Aikman with us tonight, moderating the debate. And at this point, we're going to go live into the auditorium. And would you welcome with me Dr. Aikman? Welcome to Bethel College and the Great Resurrection Debate here on March 20th, Palm Sunday, 2005. This is a debate on the historicity of the resurrection or whether Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead or not. We have two very distinguished debaters here tonight, and I'm going to introduce them, and then they are going to come out on stage and you, the audience, will be free to applause at that point. Our first debater is Dr. William Lane Craig. 
Dr. Craig earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham, England, before taking a doctorate in theology from the Ludwig Maximilians Universität München, Germany. In Germany, Dr. Craig was a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung and wrote on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. He also spent several years at the Katholica Universität Leuven in Belgium and is currently a research professor at Talbot School of Theology of La Mirada, California. Our second debater is Bishop John Shelby Spong. Bishop John Shelby Spong is a renowned author and speaker. He is the retired Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Newark, where he served for 24 years. Dr. Spong has received numerous honors, including being named Cortes, uh, Centenary Scholar by Emmanuel College, Cambridge University, and Humanist of the Year in 1999. The Protestant Episcopal Theological Seminary in Virginia and St. Paul's College have conferred on him the Doctor of Divinity Degrees and Muhlenberg University, a Doctor of Humane Letters degree. He has been scholar in residence at Christ Church, Oxford, and is a fellow of St. Daniel's Library in Wales. Will you please welcome our two debaters, Dr. Craig and Bishop John Svelby Spong. Now, for our television audience and for uh, the studio audience, I'm going to explain the rules of the debate. Each debater is going to have an opening statement of 15 minutes. Each debater is then going to have a rebuttal of 10 minutes, and then there will be a break. There will be a second rebuttal after the break by both speakers, and then a question and answer period. We will be collecting questions that are emailed in and provided by members of the audience during the break period or even beforehand, and I will select questions for the speakers from those that are given to me. Uh, each question will be given to a speaker, and he will have the chance to speak for one minute in response, and so will the other debater. We will then have a closing statement by each debater, of five minutes, and I will make a concluding statement, and then we will finish the debate. I do ask all of you in the studio audience to refrain from any kind of applause except when you are told to do so, which will be at the end. This is not a, a canned comedy show, but uh, you must understand that we must be very, very fair to each of these speakers and we must not show any partisanship while they are actually speaking. You may, of course, present your applause for the whole presentation at the end of the debate. I'm also going to be rather strict on uh, the uh, time allotted to each of the debaters, and although I'm quite sure that each of them will be honoring the time they have been given, uh, if there is any lapse in this, I shall politely but firmly um, ask the person to finish speaking. We'll do it in a reasonably gentlemanly way, I hope. Uh, this is a very important debate, and um, I'm sure you don't need to be reminded of why it's rather significant at this time of year, and uh, it'll give us a lot to think about. I would like to invite right now the opening statement by Dr. William Lane Craig. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking Bethel College and CCN for hosting this debate on the meaning of the resurrection. And I also want to say that I consider it a real privilege to be sharing the podium tonight with so influential a churchman as Bishop Spawn. My main contention in tonight's debate is that Jesus' resurrection was a real historical event and therefore meaningful for us today. So in my opening speech, I want to outline a case for the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. Now, I'm going to be giving you a lot of historical information, so hold on to your hats. 
A historical argument for Jesus' resurrection involves two steps. First, determine what are the facts to be explained, and second, determine what is the best explanation of those facts. First, what are the facts to be explained? In order to answer this question, it's important to say something about our sources for the historical Jesus. Our principal sources for the life of Jesus consist of documents written within a generation after his death, which were later collected by the church and put into one volume called the New Testament. When historians investigate Jesus' life, they're not treating the New Testament as a wholly inspired book. They're not even assuming that the New Testament is generally reliable. The historian expects to find errors and inconsistencies in even his most reliable sources. So the historian isn't presupposing that the New Testament documents are reliable. Rather, he's arguing that in the case of a specific event, there are good reasons to think that the documents are reliable on that score. So when we come to what these documents have to say about the resurrection, the question is, what historical facts about this event can we reliably recover from the documents? Now, it might come as something of a surprise to you that today the relevant facts are largely agreed upon by New Testament critics. There has been a revolution in New Testament scholarship concerning the resurrection over the last half century. Back in the 1940s and 50s, it was widely believed that the story of Jesus' empty tomb was a legend shaped by the theology of the early church, which arose many decades after Jesus was dead and gone. The post-mortem appearances of Jesus were thought to have been hallucinations brought on by the disciples' fervent faith in Jesus. And the disciples' belief that God had raised Jesus from the dead was taken to be the result of the profound impact Jesus had had upon his disciples during his life. Today, these positions have been largely abandoned within the scholarly community. Those who still cling to the older opinions represent the radical fringe of contemporary New Testament scholarship. Instead, today, the majority of scholars affirm the following three facts about what happened following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, on the Sunday morning after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. Two, on multiple occasions, various individuals and groups experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. And three, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead despite every predisposition to the contrary. What are some of the reasons that have persuaded most scholars to think that the documents are accurate with respect to these three facts? Let me simply mention a few of the reasons. First, with respect to Jesus' empty tomb, most scholars have been convinced on the basis of reasons like the following three. Reason number one, the empty tomb story is part of Mark's very old source material. Behind Mark's story of Jesus' passion lies an earlier source, which included the story of the women's discovery of his empty tomb. Mark is the earliest of our Gospels, so his source must be even earlier still. In fact, the commentator Rudolf Pesch dates this source to within seven years of Jesus' crucifixion. Contrast this with the sources for Roman and Greek history, which are usually removed one or two generations or even centuries from the events that they record. For example, the earliest biographies of Alexander the Great were written by Arian and Plutarch over 400 years after Alexander's death, and yet classical historians consider them still to be trustworthy. According to A.N. Sherwin-White in his book, Roman Society and Roman Law in the New Testament, even two generations is too short a time span to allow legendary tendencies to wipe out the hard core of historical facts. Thus, the extraordinarily early date of Mark's passion source 
effectively rules out the hypothesis that the story of the empty tomb is a late developing legend, as critics used to think. Reason number two. Mark's account of the empty tomb is multiply and independently attested by other sources. One of the most important criteria used by historians is multiple independent attestation. If an event in Jesus' life is attested by at least two independent sources, one of which is early, then the event is likely to be historical. As New Testament critic Marcus Borg explains, the logic is straightforward. If a tradition appears in an early source and in another independent source, then not only is it early, but it is also unlikely to have been made up. In the case of the empty tomb, we have not only Mark's early passion source, but also independent sources used by Matthew and John. The empty tomb is also mentioned in the early sermons, in the Acts of the Apostles, and implied by Paul in his letter to the church in Corinth. Thus we have early, multiple, independent attestation of the fact of the empty tomb, one of the most important indications of historicity. Reason number three, the tomb was discovered empty by women. In a patriarchal society like first century Palestine, where the word of a woman was looked down upon, it's remarkable that it is women who are the discoverers of Jesus' empty tomb. Any later legendary account would certainly have made male disciples, like Peter and John, discover the empty tomb. The fact that it is women rather than men who are the chief witnesses to the empty tomb is best explained by the fact that they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what for them was an awkward and embarrassing fact. In my book, I list 10 lines of evidence in support of the empty tomb, but I think enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist on the resurrection, and I quote, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb, end quote. As for that second fact, Jesus' post-mortem appearances, this fact is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars for the following two reasons. Reason number one, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' appearances, which is quoted by Paul, guarantees that such appearances occurred. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul writes, For I delivered to you what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. This information has been dated to within five years of Jesus' crucifixion. It mentions the appearances to Peter and to the Twelve disciples. Paul then goes on to say, Then He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. According to his letter to the churches of Galatia, Paul was in Jerusalem within six years of Jesus' crucifixion and spent two weeks with Peter and James. Given the early date of this information, as well as Paul's personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances can't be written off as legends. Reason number two, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. For example, the appearance to Peter is attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is attested by Luke, John, and Paul. And the appearance to the women is attested by Matthew and John. The appearance narratives span such a breadth of independent sources that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences. Even the skeptical critic, Gert Ludemann, therefore concludes, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. Finally, the origin of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. 
Think of the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jews had no idea of a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Jewish messianic expectations included no idea of a Messiah, who instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies, would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Number two, according to Old Testament law, Jesus' execution exposed him as a heretic, a man literally accursed by God. And three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Bishop Spong himself writes in his book, The Easter Moment, that something big and powerful actually happened to produce this change. Indeed, I've rarely seen a more powerful statement of this point than Bishop Spong's. He points out that the lives of both Jesus' disciples and his family were radically transformed, that Sunday became the new holy day rather than the Jewish Sabbath, that God was reconceived to be not just one person, but to include Christ, that the content of the gospel message became Jesus himself, that Jerusalem became the center of Christianity, and that leading members of the anti-Christian religious establishment became followers of Christ. All of this is historical data, he concludes, that begs for an adequate explanation. But what was that big and powerful something, if not the resurrection itself, as the disciples proclaimed? As the eminent British scholar N.T. Wright has written, without the resurrection, there is a gaping hole in the middle of first century history that nothing else can plug. That is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. In summary then, these three facts are agreed upon by the majority of New Testament scholars who have written on the subject. Jesus' empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. That brings us then to the second step of our argument, that the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. This was, of course, the explanation given by the eyewitnesses themselves, and I can think of no better explanation. Down through history, various naturalistic alternatives have been proposed, such as the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, the hallucination theory, and so on. In the judgment of contemporary scholarship, however, none of these naturalistic theories has managed to provide a plausible explanation of the facts. Does this mean, therefore, that most scholars accept the resurrection of Jesus as the best explanation? No, it does not. For in order to accept the explanation, God raised Jesus from the dead, you must be prepared to affirm that a miracle has occurred. And many historians feel that they cannot do that. Not that they deny the possibility of miracles, but they feel that in their capacity as professional historians, it's against the rules, so to speak, to appeal to miraculous explanations. To say that some event is a miracle is to make a philosophical judgment, not a historical judgment. And so as historians, they can offer no explanation. But as long as we're willing to think philosophically about history, there's nothing to bar us from drawing the inference God raised Jesus from the dead. If our minds and hearts are open to God's existence, then we will be open to miracles as well. As the Australian philosopher Peter Slezak has nicely put it, for a God who can make the whole of the universe, the odd resurrection should be child's play. Indeed, today the rational man can hardly be blamed if he concludes that on that first Easter morning, a divine miracle occurred. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Bishop Spong. Thank you, sir. Also, I'd like to thank Bethel College. I do a lot of lecturing around the world, and I don't know any place that I've ever been more warmly and more graciously welcomed. So I thank you for that. I'm also pleased to thank the Church Communications Network, and it's a privilege for me to meet Dr. Craig, who has had such a distinguished career, and who can quote me so well. <laughs> 
I find the title of this debate to be a bit misleading. I'm a Christian. I served my church first as a priest and then as a bishop for almost 50 years. I do not believe it is possible to be a Christian apart from the reality of the resurrection. I assume that my colleague, Dr. Craig, stands united with me on that proposition. The reality of the resurrection is essential. But the reality of the resurrection is not the substance of our discussion. Any attempt to suggest that it is would be a violation of both of our integrity and the integrity of Bethel College. I suspect that the differences that will appear between Dr. Craig and myself will not be about the centrality or the reality of the resurrection, but on the factual accuracy of the biblical accounts of the Easter moment, even of the way the resurrection is or can be understood. Ultimately, the most important thing that we need to establish is that it is available and eternal in every generation, not just an historical event that happened some 2,000 years ago. I am not a biblical literalist. Though I was one for many years, and my mother died a strict biblical fundamentalist, I'm still very thankful that I had that upbringing, though I have abandoned th that point of view. But that evangelical upbringing gave me an insatiable desire to study the scriptures. And that study has, de has dominated my life for my entire career. Not a day goes by that I do not wrestle with the words of the Bible. The resurrection narratives have been a primary focus of that study for me. The last book I wrote on the resurrection, not the one that Dr. Craig quoted, was revelatory in its title. I submitted that manuscript to my publisher, Harper Collins, with the working title, Resurrection, Myth and Reality. Harper Collins changed my title and published it under the title, Resurrection, Myth or Reality. I think it has to be both. They wanted to suggest that I believed that it could be one or the other. Harper has invested a lot of money in making me controversial. <laughs> and they wanted to make sure that they didn't lose on their investment. <laughs> but let me go over those two things. The reality. Yes, the resurrection's real. And Dr. Craig pointed to some of the things that I still hold quite firmly. The resurrection was an event of such power and such life-changing energy that the disciples who had all abandoned Jesus at the time of his, erection, of his arrest and had forsaken him and fled were reconstituted. And not just reconstituted, but quite willing to give their lives for the reality of that experience. There's enormous power in that. Secondly, we must not forget that these are Jewish men. And in the Jewish tradition, the most sacred part of the whole tradition was that God was one. Nothing could stand in the presence of God. And yet there was something about whatever the resurrection was that was so powerful and so overwhelming that these Jewish men had to expand their definition of God so that it was big enough to include Jesus of Nazareth. And they were no longer able to look at Jesus of Nazareth without seeing him as part of who God is. And thirdly, they created a new holy day. Now for those of us who have been in active ministry with congregations, we know how serious and important that is. When I was the Bishop of Newark, I had churches that I was quite sure that if the Lord God, God's self, had appeared before those congregations and said, folks, I want you to change the Sunday hour from 10 to 10.30 beginning next week, some in those congregations would say, but Lord, that's not the way we do it in this church. <laughs> Changing people's worship traditions is a powerful, powerful argument. But something happened that was associated with the first day of the week that created certainly within one generation a new holy day that stood side by side with Jewish Sabbath. 
And then when the Christian faith finally moved out of its Jewish orbit and into the Mediterranean Gentile world, the Jewish Sabbath was dropped and the Christian Sunday became the holy day of the Western world. It's still interesting to me that we put Jewish Sabbath and Christian Sunday together to create the weekend, which we still observe whether we are religious or not. So there is reality to the resurrection experience that I would not want anybody to think that I would doubt or question. But a God experience has to be put into human words. And that's where mythology enters. And by mythology I mean that human beings do not speak a God language. We only speak a human language. So whenever we have a God experience, we have to put that experience into our human created frame of reference. And our language is simply not, simply not big enough to capture the wonder, the mystery, the reality of that inbreaking eternity. And so what do we do? We have to develop expansive language. We have to get it beyond our abilities. And that's what I see over and over again in the biblical narratives. I take those narratives seriously. I do not take them literally. But we need to face the fact that the inadequacy of all human language is something we must deal with. The only way a 21st century person can be a Christian is to be able to put the experience of God into 21st century language. Let me illustrate that for just a moment. If you witnessed an epileptic seizure in the first century, and if you witnessed an epileptic seizure in the 21st century, the reality that you would experience would be identical. But if you were to read the explanation that first century people gave to that epileptic seizure, and the explanation that 21st century people gave to that epileptic seizure, you would recognize that language is time bound and time warped. And if you ever take the language of a human explanation and say that this is the ultimate literal truth, it seems to me you have violated the eternity of that experience. Let me look at the language of the resurrection narratives for just a bit. And to tell you, if you're going to literalize the stories, this fanciful language gets in the way of a lot of modern people. Matthew says there was an earthquake when Jesus died, and another earthquake when the resurrection occurred. Were those literal earthquakes, or was he speaking poetically? The Gospels say that at 12 noon on the first Good Friday, darkness covered the whole earth until 3 o'clock. Was that a literal darkness, perhaps an eclipse of the sun? Or was that a poetic reference to what it meant to watch this love of God die? The Gospels say that when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was split from top to bottom. You need to understand what that veil meant. It separated the holy place where people could gather from the holy of holies, which was thought to be God's dwelling place. And the only person that could go into the holy of holies was the high priest. And he could go only in only once a year and after enormous purification rites. That veil separated human life from the ultimate presence of God. Was that a literal splitting? Was that a poetic way they were trying to describe what the meaning of the death of Jesus was? Matthew says in a gospel I heard read this morning at St. James Cathedral here in South Bend that when the death of Jesus occurred, the earthquake opened up the graves. And people who had been long dead came up out of their graves and walked around in Jerusalem and were seen by people. Is that literal? Or is that poetic language? And then we're told that angels can ride on the wings of the wind to announce the resurrection. That they have the power to strike guards and put them in a state of unconscious stupor and that they can roll back the stone, and that they can talk to the women. I presume in Aramaic, since that was the only language the women spoke. 
Can these descriptions of the resurrection that include all of these poetic symbols, could they still be real? Is there something behind that language that cannot be denied? And is the story of a dead man walking out of a tomb, presumably three days after his death, physically resuscitated? Is that literal language? Or is that language of people who are so transformed by the power of the living God that they have to create human language to communicate that experience? The second thing I think we need to look at when we look at those narratives is that they disagree on almost every detail. Let me walk you through them. Who went to the tomb at dawn on the first day of the week? We have four Gospels. We have four different lists. The only consistent figure in all four of them is Mary Magdalene. Did the women see the risen Lord in the garden at dawn on the first day of the week? No, says Mark. Yes, says Matthew. No, says Luke. Yes, says John. Even my friend Jerry Falwell can't make those fit together. It just won't work. It's a contradiction. Where were the disciples when they had this life-changing, in-breaking experience of resurrected power? Where were they? The Gospels don't even agree with that. Mark says it will be in Galilee. Matthew says it was in Galilee. Luke says it was never in Galilee. It was always in Jerusalem in the immediate environs. And John, John says it was in Jerusalem first. But then when he writes an appendix to his gospel in chapter 21, he makes a Galilean appearance much, much later. Indeed, it's hard to date the time, perhaps even years. Was the risen Christ physical? Well... Paul says he appeared. He never describes that appearance, so you don't get any data as to whether it was physical or not. Mark never describes the risen Christ appearing to anyone. Oh, there's a later addition to Mark that does, but in the authentic part of Mark's gospel, there is no appearance of the risen Christ to anyone. That's our earliest gospel. Matthew, who sort of seems to say it was a physical Jesus that the women grabbed the feet of him in the garden on the morning of the resurrection. But then when he tells the story of, the, of Jesus appearing to the disciples, it's distinctly not physical. Jesus seems to come out of the heavens, clothed with the authority of the Son of Man. And he comes to give the disciples only their marching orders, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. It's only when you get to Luke and John, the last two gospels, I would date them in the late ninth decade and the mid-tenth decade. It's only in these latter Gospels that you begin to get appearances and empty tombs and all of the physical part of that resurrection story. But even here, Luke describes this Christ as having the ability to materialize on the road to Emmaus and to dematerialize after the breaking of the bread. That doesn't sound like any physicality that I understand. And John has the Christ have the ability to walk into a locked and barred upper room and still offer his physical wounds to Thomas to print, to, to feel, to touch physicality. Were they trying to determine that the experience that they were having after the death of Jesus was in fact an experience of a living Christ who was identical with that Jesus. And that's the language that they use to describe it. There's no doubt in my mind that any of us would be here today talking about the resurrection if there weren't something real about it. But I think we've got to begin to open the scriptures to scholarship, open them to a new understanding, so that we don't have to take 21st century minds and twist them into first century pretzels in order to be disciples of Jesus of Nazareth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Strong. We now have 10 minutes for the first rebuttal by Dr. Craig. Thank you, Bishop Spong, for those thoughtful remarks and criticisms. 
Uh, in this speech, I'd like to re-examine the case that I presented and see how it stands up in light of Bishop Spong's criticisms. Now, you'll recall that my argument has two steps. First step is to determine the facts to be explained, and here I listed some of the reasons that have led most scholars to agree with the facts of Jesus' empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Now here, Dr. Spong suggests that these narratives should be read as myths, not literally, that it's a mistake to think of them as literal. Well, now, I believe this is really a straw man. Nobody takes every passage in the Bible literally. When the psalmist says, let the trees of the woods clap their hands before the Lord, nobody thinks that he's teaching botany. Rather, the key to correctly interpreting the Bible is to discern the type of literature that you're reading. Now, the Bible contains a wide variety of different literary types, prophecy, history, epistle, poetry, apocalypse, and so on. And to read these indiscriminately in all the same way is going to lead to confusion. Now, when it comes to the Gospels, uh, Bishop Spong variously classifies these, sometimes as mythology, as he did tonight, but sometimes as midrash, sometimes as legend, sometimes as theology, and so on. The problem is that these are all distinct literary types, different from one another. Uh, but Dr. Spong, rather like that fellow in the Florida orange juice commercial, just throws everything into the blender at once and comes up with a sort of literary mash. And this isn't apt to be very helpful, I think, in our understanding of the Gospels. Let me share with you then the thinking of contemporary scholarship concerning the literary type of the Gospels. Contemporary scholars have come to realize that the Gospels' literary type is not mythology or midrash, but rather it is ancient biography, like Plutarch's famous lives of illustrious Greeks and Romans. According to Craig Keener in his recent commentary on the Gospel of John, and I quote, the Gospels present themselves as true accounts of Jesus' ministry. All four Gospels fit the genre of ancient biography, the life of a prominent person. Jewish Christian readers would have been most familiar with literary works concerning primary characters in terms of Hellenistic lives or ancient biographies. He concludes, Arguments concerning the biographical character of the Gospels have thus come full circle. The Gospels, long viewed as biographies until the 20th century, now again are widely viewed as biographies. Moreover, Keener notes, ancient biographies were a form of historical writing. He says biographies were essentially historical works. Thus, the Gospels would have an essentially historical function. So a correct analysis of the gospel's literary type shows that they are meant to be an account of what actually happened. Moreover, Keener notes two factors undergirding the reliability of these biographies. First, how close the gospel sources are to the events that they narrate. And secondly, the gospel's care in handing down the information in their sources. He concludes on the basis of these two factors that the gospel should be placed among the most reliable of ancient biographies. So the bottom line then is that the gospels are not mythology or midrash, rather they are ancient biography and pretty reliable ones at that. Now, Bishop Spong also says that should we, or asked rather, should we think of the resurrection of Jesus as literal? Well, I think that question has been answered decisively by N.T. Wright in his recent book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. Wright does a study of how the word resurrection is used in ancient history, in paganism, in Judaism, in Christianity. And he concludes that there is no evidence for Jews of our period using the word resurrection to denote something essentially non-concrete. Raymond Brown agrees. He says it is not accurate to claim that the New Testament references to the resurrection of Jesus are ambiguous as to whether they meant bodily resurrection. There was no other kind of resurrection. So when early Christians said he is risen from the dead, they meant it literally and bodily. And thus you have Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 arguing with the Corinthians over the question, with what kind of body do they come? The sermons in the book of Acts portray the resurrection as a physical event witnessed by various people. And, of course, the empty tomb itself is testimony that this was taken to be a literal event leaving an empty tomb in its wake. 
But Bishop Spung has a third objection. He says, what about all the inconsistencies in the narratives? Well, as I said in my first speech, no historian just throws out a source because it has inconsistencies. Indeed, the very task of the critical historian is to sift his sources to distinguish the historical from the unhistorical. And so looking for inconsistencies is just too blunt a tool to be of much value in analyzing one's sources. It's like trying to do brain surgery with a machete. Moreover, the inconsistencies that Bishop Spong is talking about aren't within a single source. They're between independent sources. But obviously, it doesn't follow from an inconsistency between independent sources that both of the sources are wrong. At worst, it only follows that one is wrong if they cannot be harmonized. Now, I think that most of the inconsistencies you've mentioned can be harmonized. They're all answers to all of these. But I don't have time in this speech, obviously, to deal with them. Let me simply point out that the gospel accounts are uh, unanimous and harmonious in their historical core, which is what I'm arguing for tonight. The discrepancies occur in the secondary details. All four Gospels agree on the following facts. That Jesus of Nazareth was crucified in Jerusalem by Roman authority at the time of the Passover feast, having been arrested and convicted on charges of blasphemy by the Jewish Sanhedrin and then slandered before the Roman governor Pilate on charges of treason. He died within a few hours and was buried Friday afternoon by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb, which was then sealed with a stone. Certain women followers of Jesus, including Mary Magdalene, having observed his interment, visited his tomb early on Sunday morning, only to find it empty. Thereafter, Jesus appeared alive from the dead to the disciples, including Peter, who then became proclaimers of the message of his resurrection. Now, all four Gospels agree on those facts. Many more details could be added if you uh, include, in addition to that, facts which are attested by three out of the four. The historian Michael Grant concludes, true, the discovery of the empty tomb is narrated differently by the different Gospels. But if we apply the same sort of criteria that we would apply to any other ancient literary sources, then the evidence is firm and plausible enough to necessitate the conclusion that the tomb was indeed found empty. So I think we have good grounds for believing that the tomb was empty. What about the appearances? Well, here Bishop Spong asked, are they really physical? Isn't that a feature only of the later Gospels? Well, the case I present it doesn't depend on the nature of the appearances. It leaves it open whether they were visionary or physical. But let me say briefly why I do think they were physical. The claim that they only were physical in later Gospels assumes that these Gospels were written much later. But I think we have every reason to think that Acts was written prior to AD 62, and Luke's Gospel, therefore, sometime in the late AD 50s. That places it just as early as Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Secondly, there's no evidence whatsoever that physical appearances only came later. On the contrary, we have multiple independent attestation of physical appearances. Indeed, our sources are unanimous on this. Thirdly, if originally all the disciples saw were visions of Jesus, then it wouldn't have led to belief in his resurrection. At most, it would have led to belief in his exaltation to heaven, but not to his being raised from the dead. So I think we've got good grounds for affirming the appearances. Dr. Spong agrees with me that something big and powerful happened to bring about the origin of the disciples' belief. And he says we must affirm the reality of the resurrection and we must affirm that it be available in every generation. But where my disagreement is, I think, is that Bishop Spong wants to retain the language of Christian theology while evacuating it of any literal significance. On Bishop Spong's view, Jesus wasn't literally raised from the dead. His corpse was thrown into a shallow dirt grave where it rotted away. Jesus is literally dead. So the words about Jesus being raised in the meaning of God and the resurrection being available to every generation really are in the end empty. It's just flowery phrases. Uh, it is the language of Christian theology, but without the literal content. And so my concern is that the power and life of the resurrection cannot be available to every generation unless this is a real event that actually happened rather than just mythology or a fairy tale. And therefore, I think it's critical that we affirm the historicity of the resurrection as a basis for our affirmation of its meaning.
Thank you, Dr. Craig. And now Bishop Spong for the rebuttal. I have great admiration for a man who can quote Gerd Ludemann and Tom Wright in the same presentation. They represent sort of the, the extremes in biblical scholarship. Dr. Craig has used a trick. That's an, in, that's an incorrect word. He's used, what shall I say? He's done the same thing that politicians do. He says, everybody thinks of it my way. Most scholars, he said a number of times, do this. Most scholars do that. Well, he and I must read a totally different group of scholars. I'm a member of the Jesus Seminar. We have 250 PhD Bible scholars, Catholic and Protestant, and they would not agree at all with either the timing uh, that Dr. Craig mentioned or with some of his historicity of such things as the, as the tomb, uh, the empty tomb. When you read biblical material, you're not always reading primary sources. We know for a fact that Matthew copied Mark into his gospel. Matthew copies about 90% of Mark into his gospel. We know that Luke also had Mark in front of him when he wrote, so Luke copies about half of Mark into his gospel. So when Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree, it's no mystery. They have the same source. Mark is the primary source for all of them. Let me suggest that, that our dating system would be quite different. Paul, in my dating scheme, would write between 50 and 64. I assume that you would agree probably with that. But when we get past that, I would date Mark after 70. I would date Matthew in the mid-80s. I would date Luke the late 80s, maybe even the early 90s. And I've never seen anybody that suggested that Acts was as early as as Dr. Craig has suggested. Indeed, if you read people like Burton Mack, you'll find that he dates Acts way in the second century. There's a great deal of debate about that, but it's interesting to me that the people who want to make sure that literal biblical content is believed always opt for the earlier and earlier dating processes, which I don't believe can be substantiated. The fact is that the Gospels are written sometime between 40 and 70 years after the earthly life of Jesus came to an end, and it was written in a language that Jesus didn't speak. So before you and I read our Bibles, the story of Jesus has lived in oral transmission for 40 to 70 years, and has gone through one translation. All I want us to do is to keep open our minds to the possibility that the story might have grown in that transmission not the essential experience, but the way it is described. Please recognize there is a difference between an experience which is real and eternal and the way anybody explains that experience at any given moment in time. The explanation always warps it in time, always binds it in time. Let me also suggest that the idea that the Gospels are biography is an idea that I know of no one in the New Testament world that I associate with would agree. I think of the Gospels, at least the synoptics, I can't make a case for John, but the synoptics, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, I would say that the underlying principle creating those is liturgy, not biography, liturgy. He even suggested that everybody agrees that the crucifixion took place during the time of the Passover. I'm not sure everybody agrees with that at all. One of the earliest ways in which the Christ was interpreted was by Paul, who said, Christ is our new Passover. And you need to understand the Jewish Passover to understand what that claim was. It was an astonishing claim. In the Passover story, the angel of death passed over Jewish homes where the blood of the Paschal lamb had been placed on the doorpost. So the blood of the Paschal lamb was thought to have the power to dispel death. Paul says, Jesus is our new Passover. I think what lies behind that is that people were trying to process the Jesus experience. He died on the cross. They needed to make sense out of that. And so they likened it to the death of the Paschal Lamb. The cross became the doorpost of the world. The blood of the Paschal Lamb was shed on the cross. That blood has the power to overcome death. Those of us who come to God through that Paschal Lamb's self-offering, can find eternal life. That's a powerful sermon that Paul was preaching. And I think that's probably what led them to see or to begin to place 
the crucifixion at the time of the Passover. A scholar at Birmingham University, where Dr. Craig got his doctorate, is named Michael Goulder, Michael Donald Goulder. Fascinating man, because he became an atheist late in his life, but he was a profound New Testament scholar. But Michael Goulder suggested that the primary thing that organizes the New Testament is the liturgical life of the synagogue, because the stories of Jesus were remembered and recalled in the synagogue. That's where they lived. The Christian movement didn't break away from the synagogue officially until 88 of this common era. So the Jesus narrative was lived in the synagogue. And as it was lived in the synagogue, it was constantly interpreted against synagogue worship. Have you ever wondered why Mark is the shortest gospel of the three? I think it's because Mark gives you Jesus stories that go from Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year, to Passover, the first celebration of the, of the Jewish year in the month of Nisan. And John the Baptist, who opens Mark's gospel, is, is very much a Rosh Hashanah figure. What happened at Rosh Hashanah? They blew the trumpet. They gathered the people. They said, prepare for the kingdom of God to come, which is the essential John the Baptist message. And then you drive that gospel all the way through. The Jews had a day called the Festival of Dedication. It came in the month of Keslev, our month of December. We tend to call it Hanukkah. But in the Festival of Dedication, they celebrated the light of God being restored to the temple, the true worship of God being restored. It comes out of the Maccabean period of Jewish history. It's interesting to me that exactly at that point in Mark's Gospel, he tells the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, the light of God coming down upon Jesus, who is the new temple, the new meeting place between God and human life. And the idea that Jesus is the new temple gets picked up in the later Gospels when Jesus is quoted as saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. And they didn't understand, says the Gospel writer, because he was referring to the temple of his own body. The only way that I believe that they could have seen Jesus as the new temple was that they lived in a world where the temple had been destroyed, which happened in the year 70 AD in the Great Roman War. So I see Jesus being interpreted liturgically against the background of the Jewish worship cycle, and that's the organizing principle. The reason Matthew and Mark had to expand, Matthew and Luke had to expand Mark, was that they wanted to have Christian readings for all of the Sabbaths of the year. And Mark only provided about six and a half months. So Matthew and Luke both stretched Mark. Matthew stretched it in a very Jewish direction. Luke stretched it in a much more Gentile direction. I think if we can begin to develop liturgical eyes, to begin to read our narratives, we will begin to see so much more. One of the reasons that I don't think we've been able as Christians to look at the Bible as that which grew, look at the Gospels as that which grew out of the synagogue worship tradition is that we have been frankly anti-Semitic throughout our history. When I was a Sunday school boy, going to my evangelical Sunday school in Charlotte, North Carolina, I never met a good Jew in my Sunday school material. They were all evil people. They were sinister. They were out to get Jesus, or they were out to get Paul. Nobody ever told me that Jesus was a Jew. That sort of escaped notice. Oh, I knew that Judas Iscariot was a Jew. I knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were Jews, and the chief priests were Jews. The scribes, they were Jews, but nobody ever told me that Jesus was a Jew and that Paul was a Jew and that Mary and Joseph were Jews and Mary Magdalene was a Jew and all of the disciples were Jews because they were good people. It was given to me as good Christians against bad Jews. Well, I think we've got to begin to open our eyes and to recognize that this Jewish Jesus was interpreted first within a Jewish frame of reference. And then when we left that frame of reference, we lost a lot of our understanding. One final note to, before I finish. You've heard many a time, I'm sure, Jesus died for my sins. It's a mantra among Christians. Do you ever wonder where it comes from? The Jews had a day called Yom Kippur, 
where they killed a lamb, a lamb who was perfect mentally, morally, and physically. And then they took the blood of this lamb who stood between them and God because they weren't aware, they, they weren't capable of standing in that place close to God. And they sprinkled the blood of this lamb on the people so that they were washed in the blood of the lamb, cleansed from their sins and restored to God. That was a Jewish worship tradition and it has deep echoes in the Christian tradition and I think we miss them because we cannot read the Bible with Jewish eyes. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. We have now concluded the first part of this debate, and I want to thank our two participants. We're going to take a break for about eight minutes, so uh, please don't go and have a, uh, a backyard picnic or something. Uh, we will come back and we will have the rebuttal of the rebuttal, as it might be called by both debaters, and then there will be a time of questions that will be entertained to each of the debaters from the studio audience and from the television audience. So please come back in about seven or eight minutes. Thank you. Welcome back to the second part of the Great Resurrection Debate here at Bethel College in South Bend, Indiana, between Bishop John Shelby Spong and Dr. William Craig. I would like to emphasize uh, before we go any further that neither of these two speakers is representing any particular organization. This is a debate between two individuals who have spoken um, in many venues on this topic, so please don't associate their views with any particular organization that you may have in mind. What we'd like to do now is to welcome back our two main speakers, Dr. Craig and Bishop Spong, for what you might call a rebuttal of a rebuttal. Uh, this gives them a chance to respond to what was criticized in their initial um, presentations by the other speaker. And we will start, in that case, with Dr. Craig. You'll recall that the first step of the positive case I offered for the resurrection of Jesus as an historical event was that the majority of New Testament critics today uh, accept the historicity of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. And I described the revolution that has taken place in resurrection studies over the last half century. Bishop Spong says, well, this is a politician's trick, uh, just trying to say that most scholars agree with you when, in fact, they do not. Now, I will say that I did say that deliberately and uh, on purpose. And the reason I did is because over and over again, as I prepared for this debate in Dr. Spong's books, I found him assuring his readers that no scholar takes these resurrection narratives literally, that most scholars think that the empty tomb is an unhistorical legend, that few scholars think that Jesus appeared physically alive from the dead. And as a person who has done his doctorate in the resurrection at the University of Munich, I knew that these statements were false. I know the literature. And I knew that these uh, statements were misleading his readers. And so I wanted deliberately to communicate to you today that uh, when Dr. Spong says, for example, no scholar he knows of thinks that the Gospels are biographies, no scholar he knows of dates the Book of Acts earlier than AD 62, with all due respect, he's simply out of touch with contemporary scholarship. Take the question of the Gospels being biographies. Graham Stanton, British New Testament scholar, says 20 years ago, only a few scholars dared to challenge the belief that the Gospels were unique in literary genre. But he says Burridge's book, Richard Burridge's book, What Are the Gospels, turned the tide of scholarly opinion. So that today scholars do recognize these are of a biographical genre. They're not mythology. They're not myth. They're not midrash. They're a historical form of writing, and I think accurate ones at that. Michael Goulder, whom he cites, is one of the most radical and isolated maverick New Testament critics on the scene today. Hardly anybody agrees with Goulder's views, whereas the majority do accept that the Gospels are of the genre of biography. Also with regard to the resurrection, my colleague Gary Habermas has recently completed a survey of over 1,400 articles published over the last 25 years on the resurrection. 
And his survey showed that 75% of scholars who have dealt with the subject argued in favor of the historicity of the empty tomb, and there was nearly universal agreement concerning the appearances and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. So these are indeed uh, facts that are recognized by the majority of scholars today. Now, Dr. Spong says, but it's not multiply and independently attested, as you claim, because the Gospels have Mark as their only primary source. Not at all. As I argued, the non Matthean vocabulary in the Gospel of Matthew shows that Matthew is using an additional source besides Mark. John is independent of Mark, so that's an additional source. Luke and John both have the story of the disciples, Peter and John, visiting the tomb, so they don't get that from Mark, and they're independent of each other, so that's traditional. I mentioned the sermons in the book of Acts, which mentioned the empty tomb. So the empty tomb is abundantly attested uh, by multiple and independent sources, one of the most important criteria for historicity. He says, but there was a period of 40 years of tradition. Well, I, I don't think that's true in the first place. Scholars like Bo Reiki, uh, Donald Guthrie, Colin Hemer all date the Book of Acts prior to AD 62. But even given his late dating, remember what Sherwin White said, even two generations is too short a time span to allow legendary tendencies to wipe out the hard core of historical facts. There may be discrepancies in the circumstantial aspects of the narratives, but on the core, as I showed you, they are remarkably harmonious and unified. And remember, we're not talking about a 40-year gap. Mark's source for the Passion goes back to within seven years of the crucifixion. Paul's information in 1 Corinthians 15 goes back to within five years of the crucifixion. This makes the window of opportunity for the accrual, accrual of legend to be virtually impossible. So I think we have good grounds for affirming these facts. Now the real question then is, what is the best explanation of these facts? Well, Bishop Spong defends in his view what I call the simple Simon theory of the resurrection. The basic idea of this theory is that the doctrine of the resurrection came about because Simon Peter couldn't explain properly the new understanding of Jesus' crucifixion that he had come to. According to Dr. Spong's theory, after Jesus' death, Simon went back to Galilee, where he struggled for months to understand Jesus' crucifixion. And finally, he came to see, in Bishop Spong's words, that, quote, the crucifixion was the final episode in the story of Jesus' life. It demonstrated that it is in giving life away that we find life, that it is in giving love away that we find love. Simon came to understand that God had taken the life of Jesus into the divine nature, and that this life, now part of God, was available to them forever. But Simon was at a loss to explain his new insight to his fellow disciples. So he described it to them as, quote unquote, Jesus' resurrection, even though he knew Jesus hadn't literally risen from the dead. And the others came to share Simon's insight and adopted his manner of speaking. So the bottom line is that the doctrine of the resurrection is the result of simple Simon's inability to express himself clearly. Now. What's funny about this theory is that even at face value, it doesn't even try to explain many of the phenomena that Bishop Spong himself said required explaining, such as the transformation of Jesus' family, like James and Jesus' brothers, the shift from Sabbath worship to Sunday worship, or the conversion of hostile Jewish leaders like Saul of Tarsus. So even at face value, the theory doesn't work. But even more importantly, the theory doesn't explain even what it sets out to explain, namely the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. As N.T. Wright points out, Judaism had plenty of ways for talking about divine forgiveness, but declaring one's recently executed leader to be Messiah, or that he had in any sense been raised from the dead, was not one of them. On Bishop Spong's view, Wright says, there really was no early belief in resurrection at all since the word resurrection was never used to denote a non-bodily extension of life in a heavenly realm, however glorious. Spong, he says, has to postulate that at some point someone began to use to denote this belief language which had never meant that before and continued not to mean it in either paganism, Judaism, or Christianity, and that other people who knew that resurrection meant bodies nevertheless went along with this usage. 
We might add to Wright's critique that uh, using such misleading resurrection language to express the new meaning of the crucifixion would have been utterly counterproductive in winning Gentile or Jewish converts because both of them denied that historical resurrections ever occur within history. Add to this the fact that the theory offers nothing to explain the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances, and you find that really the theory doesn't explain anything. It's just not big and powerful enough. The simple Simon theory is just too simplistic. I think when you compare the evidence, the earliest disciples gave the right explanation when they said that God has raised him from the dead. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Bishop Spong. Well, I must say that that time, Bill, I didn't recognize myself in your recreation of me. I think resurrection is so much bigger than your caricaturing of it. Let me say just a couple of things, and then I'd like to illustrate the point. It doesn't do a lot of good for me to say scholars support me and for him to say scholars support him. We need to say, who are these scholars? I'm quite willing to admit that the great majority of evangelical scholars will support Bill Craig's point of view. But I'd also like you to know that in the world of academia, not one of them has significant standing. And in the world of scholarship that I work in, which would be the Jesus Seminar people, they would dismiss them out of hand as scholars. But we can debate who's a scholar and who's not a scholar. I have no desire to try to, to convert Dr. Craig to my point of view. My only point of, my only reason for being in this debate is because I think there are a lot of people that live in my century that are turned off by the literal symbols surrounding the Christian story. And I want to offer them a way into the experience of the Christian story where they don't have to trip over the literalized first century symbols. One final minor thing is that if Mark's source, if Mark writes the earliest passion story, then I'd like to ask why he overwhelmingly shapes that story by references to the Old Testament, basically to Psalm 22 and to Isaiah 53. I'd like to spend most of my time, I'm tired of rebutting rebuttals of rebuttals. I'd like to, to, to press on in a, in a more positive direction. A friend of mine, before he died, was named Carl Sagan. He was a great American astrophysicist. Carl Sagan was a fascinating man. He was Jewish by his ethnic background. He was a militant atheist by his religious persuasion. But he was a funny kind of atheist. He's the kind of atheist that seemed to talk about God all the time. I called him a God-intoxicated atheist. He also enjoyed puncturing the simplistic mindset of people who literalized all religious stories. We were on a conference staff together in Washington, D.C., two years before he died. And he saw me, and he came bounding across the room, and he said, Jack, have you ever thought of what the ascension of Jesus looks like to an astrophysicist? I said, no, Carl, I haven't thought about that a great deal, but I knew I was going to have to. Now, just for background, let me tell you that the ascension story comes into the Christian tradition in the writings of Luke. He's a reference to it in the 24th chapter of his gospel. But the biggest story is in the first chapter of the book of Acts. And I would date that well into the ninth decade, maybe even into the tenth decade. So before that, you don't have a, an ascension story. Indeed, I think I could argue that Paul saw resurrection and ascension as part of the same thing, because I think he saw the resurrection as God having raised Jesus into the presence of the living God, out of whom he appeared to certain chosen witnesses, including Paul who says that what he saw was no different from what anybody else saw. And I don't know anybody that thinks Paul saw a physically resuscitated body. He saw some vision of God that transformed his life. But in any event, Carl began to talk. We live in a space age. He said, do you know that if Jesus literally ascended into the sky, and if he traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, he hasn't yet escaped our galaxy? And then in his Sagan-esque way, he said, and our galaxy is one of billions and billions and billions of galaxies. I thought he was going to have a religious experience. <laughs> but you see, Carl Sagan is right. We can't literalize that story 
and have it make sense to people who live in a space age. We know that the universe that we live in is enormous. It would take light traveling at the speed of light which travels at 186,000 miles per second, about, would take over 100,000 years to go from one end of our galaxy to the other. And our galaxy is only one of billions of galaxies in the visible universe. So we have to think in a whole different frame of reference. But you see, I don't believe that the author of Luke Acts, whoever he was, I don't think he meant to tell a literal story. I think he was preaching a sermon, trying to help people understand the meaning of Jesus. And I suspect his text was the story of the ascension of Elijah that's told in the Old Testament. Now, if you go back and read that story, you will discover that Elijah walks out with his single disciple, Elisha, to this rendezvous point, and everybody knows that Elijah is going to depart this world. And so Elisha comes up to him and he says, Master, I'd like a final deathbed request. What is it, my son? Well, if I'm going to be your successor as the prophet of Israel, I want to be endowed with a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, I don't know that I can give you that. But if you see me ascending into the sky, then you will know that your request has been granted. And then at that moment, out of the sky, according to this wonderful story, comes a fiery chariot drawn by magical fiery horses. Is that literal? But that, that chariot comes out of the sky and it stops right down there across the Jordan River where Elijah and Elisha are waiting, just like it's a regular stop on a regular bus route. And Elijah hops on, says farewell, and then even the ancient people knew that a chariot couldn't go up into the sky defying gravity, which they didn't know anything about. And so we're told that there's a whirlwind that comes behind that chariot, and magical horses driving a magical chariot and propelled by a whirlwind, and Elijah goes up into the sky, and Elisha sees. And so Elisha, Elijah, Elisha knows that he will receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Luke was trying to tell us that Jesus was a new and greater Elijah. He was trying to tell us that even when you take the greatest life that we've had in our Jewish tradition, it isn't big enough to capture what we believe we have experienced in the God presence in Jesus of Nazareth. And so he takes that Elijah story and he magnifies it to the tenth power to try to make it big enough to capture the experience. Jesus goes up into heaven without any props. He doesn't need chariots. He doesn't need horses. He doesn't need a whirlwind. And all Elijah can do is give a double portion of his enormous but still human spirit to his single disciple. Luke says this Christ figure in whom we have met God in this dramatic new way can give the infinite power of God's Holy Spirit that will last through all the ages a new and greater Elijah. And then we know that he's, we know he's using this Elijah story because he takes the fire from the chariots and the fiery horses and he makes it the tongues of fire that light upon the disciples' heads at the time of Pentecost. And then he takes that whirlwind and he turns it into the mighty rushing wind of the Spirit, the Ruach of God, that fills the room where they were the story can be transformed. It can still be powerfully true because language has to struggle to capture the essence of God. You do not diminish the story by expanding the language and saying, this is the best we human beings can do to capture the infinite and living presence of God. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. Would uh, both gentlemen please come to the podiums right now. We are going to have a, a question and answer period. These are questions that have been written by members of the audience and members of the television audience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the debaters a question that was specifically addressed to that person. And the other debater will have an opportunity to give his own comment on that. The first question is to Dr. William Craig. The question is, why must one take the resurrection of Jesus as a literal historical event? Cannot one be a Christian and regard the whole thing merely as a metaphor? 
My argument is that the resurrection of Jesus was a real historical event. So I'm not arguing that one, what one has to do. I'm simply arguing for the truth of the position that when you look at the historical evidence, you have very good grounds for thinking this, this literally did happen. So I'm not making any verdicts tonight or judgments about who and who is, is not a Christian. That's beside the point for my interest as a historian. My interest as a historian is, did this event actually occur? And I think that there are quite good grounds for thinking that it occurred, both in, in the facts that I've explained and then in assessing what is the best explanation of those facts. So I'm not interested in making judgments. As I explained in my uh, second speech, the earliest Christians took this as a literal uh, event, uh, not as a metaphor. That's the way they thought of it. And the question is, were they right or were they wrong? That's, that's the question I'm interested in. Thank you very much. Bishop Paul. In regard, all of that language is just inadequate language. Uh, I think the event is real. I think there's enormous power. I think the resurrection is a God experience. I don't believe human language can ever capture the essence of that God experience. And so all I'm arguing for is a, to find a way that we today can continue to walk into that experience. Thank you, Mr. Spong. I have a question for you, sir. Um, and I'm going to rephrase it in, I think, language that perhaps most best articulates the, question, uh, the question's intent. You would agree that something did happen on that resurrection morning. Yes. And yet you dispute whether literally a human cadaver that was dead came alive and was seen then by various disciples. So if the physical reconstitution of the human body did not take place, what event does the resurrection actually signify? I don't think the resurrection has a thing to do with the body. I think the resurrection was an experience where the disciples' eyes were open to see the reality of God who is around us at all times, but we are unable to see it. And they saw Jesus as a part of that reality. And they stepped into that vision and they experienced the resurrecting power that was present in him. Uh, the idea that it was a body that walked out of the, out of the tomb uh, it's, it's not even an appealing idea to me. Uh, I don't need for it to be physical. I find it rather amazing that religious people who talk about the life of the spirit discover that the spiritual things have no meaning unless they can be attached to physical symbols. And I'd like to suggest that spiritual is a word a lot bigger than that and, and one we ought not to diminish by, by sort of hacking at it because it's not attached to some sort of physical resuscitation. The idea that, that God would reverse the life process uh, and do billions of individual miracles to bring back a, a body that had been dead for three days, it strikes me as to make God a kind of miracle worker. Dr. Craig. Well, as I said, it does depend on whether or not you believe in the existence of a personal God who is able to do miracles. If you don't believe that that sort of a being exists, you will not be open to the resurrection of Jesus as an actual event. But if there is a creator and designer of the universe who is distinct from the world, then clearly he would have the power to raise someone from the dead, particularly his son, as a vindication of the radical uh, messianic claims that he made uh, and for which he was crucified. But where I disagree most with Bishop Spong is when he says it's not appealing to him, that he doesn't need it to be physical. You can't determine the truth by what appeals to you. The truth is objective in and of itself whether you find it appealing or not. And I think we have to be very, very careful lest we use our own sentiments to shape what we think reality is because what happens then is you begin to create God in your own image and you begin to, to make him over after the way you want him to be. And I think that's, that's well, it's really idolatry in a sense. Okay, thank you. This is a question to both of you, but I will pose it first to Dr. Craig. What should one understand from Jesus' own words about his resurrection before he died? Could, could you be more specific? What words do you have in mind? Well, he spoke, I think, about uh, his being resurrected in some form or other in the New Testament accounts. Yeah. Well, if you're asking me as a historian, I would say that we have very good grounds for thinking that Jesus understood his impending death 
Uh, he had seen John the Baptist uh, killed. He knew what had happened to him. He understood the tension that was in the air. He understood that by going around uh, claiming to be uh, the Messiah, that he was putting himself in harm's way. So I think Jesus had a very clear premonition of what was going to happen to him. And I think that he foresaw his vindication as well. He uh, didn't think that God would leave his righteous servant uh, abandoned forever, that God would vindicate him. And so I think this, it's quite good grounds for thinking that Jesus uh, foresaw what would happen to him, that he even provoked it by his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecies, and that he embraced it willingly. So I don't think this was some sort of an accident that overtook Jesus of Nazareth, but it was something that he deliberately uh, embraced. Thank you. Dr. Spohn, Archbishop Spohn. I'm not Archbishop, thank heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think it, I don't think it's very important to us to try to get into the mind of Jesus and try to determine what he understood. That's difficult enough just with the Gospels because part of the difficulty we have is did Jesus really say this or did the Christian community put these words into Jesus' mouth? Uh, I can't imagine Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, for example, but I think he is the bread of life because he feeds me in an eternal way. I don't think he said, I am the vine, you are the branches, but he is the source through which the life of God flows to me, so I understand that analogy. Uh, a lot of things in the New Testament, I think, are put into the mind of Jesus by the Christian church, meditating upon the meaning that they experience from him. So I don't find it terribly edifying to try to, to spend much of our time figuring out what the mind of Jesus was, because all we have is the mind of Jesus filtered through the life of the church and through these four gospel writers. Thank you. Uh, a question to Bishop Spong. Um, it seems from the language of 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul himself believed in a physical resurrection as having taken place. How would you account for that? Well, I would disagree with that. Uh, I don't think that idea even occurred to Paul. He spends a lot of time trying to understand uh, what a body is, and he winds up with all sorts of new analogies. He says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. But let's look at the people that he lists in that list of those who have seen the Lord. Uh, he says, first of all, to Peter, Cephas, and then to the twelve. That's a fascinating reference because presumably Judas Iscariot is still among them. They don't elect Matthias to replace Judas until the book of Acts, which is some 40 years later. And then he says to 500 brethren at once, and no gospel makes any attempt to try to authenticate that. There are some people that try to make that be the Pentecost experience, but I think that's a very long stretch. And then he says to James, and there's a real debate as to what James that is, and there are three candidates, James the son of Alphaeus, James the son of Zebedee, and James the brother of Jesus. And I would say that the weight of New Testament scholarship would identify that as James the brother of Jesus. And then he says to the apostles, now who are they? He's already listed the twelve. This seems to be a new group, or these apostles aren't the same as the disciples. And then in the most telling way, he says, he appeared to me. I think it is terribly important that we recognize that the earliest witness to the resurrection, which is Paul, says that his experience was no different from that of any of the others except that his was last. And Adolf Harnack, a great historian of the Christian church in the 19th century, dated the conversion of Paul from one to six years after the crucifixion. I don't know of anybody that's challenged that, but you may know of someone who has. But anyway, if it's one to six years afterwards, and Paul says what he experienced was the same as what everybody else experienced, then it can hardly be a resuscitated body that walked out of a grave. Bishop Spong, I'm sorry, I must ask you to curtail that, that answer. Uh, and please, in our remaining uh, Two minutes, please be as concise with the time factor as you can be. Um, a question for Dr. Craig. Do I not get a counter response? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. I'm sorry. I think it's very clear that Paul believed in a physical resurrection. Um, when he uh, describes what kind of body they, the resurrected will have, he says that it is sown a perishable body, it is raised as a an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual or supernatural body. There is historical continuity between the body that is sown and the body that is raised. So there is no doubt in my mind that when Paul said 
he was buried and he was raised, Paul assumed that there was an empty tomb left behind, that this was a physical resurrection. Again, he uses the uh, demonstrative word this. This perishable must put on the imperishable. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Uh, when he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, flesh and blood is a Semitic idiom meaning people. Uh, frail human nature, as when he says in Galatians, that when he was converted, I did not confer with flesh and blood, but I went away into Arabia. And what he means is what he says in the second half of the verse, the corruptible cannot put on incorruption, it must therefore be transformed. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. And we have time for one more question, and I'm going to take the privilege of being moderated to pose my own question. Um, Bishop Spong, um, you would certainly, reading, listening to your uh, comments in this debate, uh, clearly you think something happened, uh, a religious experience, if we can use the generic term. Do you think the experience of the disciples of Jesus on the resurrection morning was unique to Christianity or was it a religious experience that might be common to many other religions in the world today? I have no idea. I only know that we receive it as unique within the Christian tradition. But I long ago stopped telling God what God is able to do with other people. For me, uh, it is a uniquely Christian experience and I want to walk through the Christ path into the, into the presence of the living God. Uh, because that's the reality. Uh, my problem with the way you phrase the question and with a lot of the debate is that my problem is that I don't have a language big enough to tell you what I believe the resurrection is. And that's difficult. And I can't use the language of the tradition because it no longer communicates in the world in which I live. And I, but I'm so convinced of the reality of the experience that I keep looking for a way that we can open that experience into, into the common mind of people and have them walk into it. You see, the resurrection doesn't mean anything if it was just an event 2,000 years ago. It's got to be an eternal event which continues to resurrect in every generation. So I don't want to bind it in time with physical symbols. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. Dr. Craig. Well, I certainly agree that it must continue on in time, but it can't continue on in time unless it had a beginning, if, unless there was a seminal event at the root. And this gets back to the, the, the simple Simon theory, as I call it. Uh, Bishop Spong, and I quoted him, says that Simon came to see that it is in giving love away that we find love, in giving life away we find life. And that's an insight that is not unique to Christianity, clearly. It's, it's a true insight, but it's hardly unique to the Christian faith, and it is hardly expressed by saying he is risen from the dead, which as uh, N.T. Wright said, had never been used in antiquity in that sort of way. It always, in paganism, Judaism, and Christianity, referred to a physical bodily resurrection from the dead. So I don't think that Bishop Spong has really come to grips with his own work, which is very fine, on this incredible transformation that occurred. He's still left with that big gaping hole in the middle of the first century that begs to be filled by the resurrection itself. Dr. Craig, thank you very much. And that unfortunately concludes our uh, general question time. Uh, we now have five minutes for each of the debaters to make a closing statement. And um, I ask Dr. Mr. Bishop Spong to sit down and Dr. Craig to start. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Well, in my closing statement, I'd like to draw together some of the threads of this debate and see what conclusions we can reach. I've maintained tonight that the resurrection was a real historical event. We saw that the majority of scholars today, and I mean first-rate scholars, agree on the essential facts to be explained. By contrast, Bishop Spong denies all three of these facts. He rejects the women's discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. He denies that the disciples saw appearances of Jesus. And he even denies that the original disciples believed in Jesus' resurrection at all, as that word is properly defined. Ironically, then, this places his views further outside of mainstream scholarship than the views of the fundamentalists that he so scornfully speaks of in his writings. Moreover, I think we saw that if you're open to the existence of God, then it's pretty hard to deny that the best explanation of the facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. 
And again, sadly, this explanation, which is the one given by the original eyewitnesses, isn't available to Bishop Spong because he doesn't believe in the existence of a personal God distinct from the universe who is the creator of the world. And so he's forced to these desperate expedients like the simple Simon theory, uh, which postulates a cause that is neither big enough nor powerful enough to explain the facts, and which is therefore convinced almost, well, I think virtually no one, uh, certainly no scholar. Now, if I'm right that the resurrection of Jesus really did happen, then I think this has enormous implications for today. It means that Jesus is not just some person in the dusty pages of ancient history or a symbolic figure on a stained glass window. Rather, he is alive and can be known today. Moreover, as the conqueror of death, he holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and he who lives and believes in me shall never die. I think it's one of the tragedies of our day that millions of people in mainline Protestant denominations have been denied the opportunity of such a personal relationship with Christ because their churches have been derouted by liberal theology which replaced the risen Christ with myths and symbols. Instead of the gospel, the laity are fed a blasé diet of humanism and moralistic sermonizing. And as a result, their hearts are left empty and craving for spiritual reality. I know. I've been there. You see, I wasn't raised in a church going home myself. But when I became a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life. And in the search for answers, I began to attend a church in our community. Unfortunately, it was a, a, a liberal church, which no longer preached the gospel that Christ died for our sins and was raised for our redemption. As one lay leader confided privately to me, it was just a social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. And I found no answers there, nothing to fill the spiritual void that was in my soul. And then one day I walked into my German class and I sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that is always so happy, it just makes you sick. And I tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and I said, Sandy, what are you always so happy about anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. And I said, well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? And she said, because he loves you, Bill. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was so filled with despair and emptiness. And she said that there was someone who really loved me. And who was it but the God of the universe? And that thought staggered me to think that the God of the universe could love that worm, Bill Craig, down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth. I began to read the New Testament, and as I did so, I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. His words had the ring of truth about them, and there was an authenticity about his life that wasn't characteristic of these people who claimed to be his followers in the church I was going to. And I realized I couldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, after a period of about six months of the most intense soul-searching, I just came to the end of myself and cried out to God. And I felt this tremendous infusion of joy, like a balloon being blown up and blown up until it was ready to burst. I rushed outside. It was a warm Midwestern summer night. I could see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. And I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment changed my whole life. You see, I thought enough about this message to realize if it were really the truth, if it were really the truth, then I could do nothing less than devote my entire life to spreading this message among mankind. And so if you're in the situation I was in, I'd invite you to do the same thing I did. Pick up the New Testament, begin to read it, and ask yourself, could this really be the truth? I believe that it could change your life in the way that it changed mine. Great. Thank you, Bishop Spong. Bill, I rejoice in your conversion experience. I'm, I'm sorry that you decided to define my understanding of God, and I think you did it very inadequately. But I also re was raised in that kind of church, the kind that spoke to you, and it didn't speak to me. Maybe that says people are different. In the early part of the 20th century, a group of evangelical Christians published a series of tracts that they called the Fundamentals. This was their attempt in the light of the great advances over the last 600 years from Copernicus to Einstein and perhaps far beyond that, which had eroded and shattered certain religious convictions. They wanted to strike back. 
They wanted to find out what were the irreducible fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. And one of them, they said, was the physical, bodily, corpuscular nature of the resurrected body of Jesus. I think they confused the fundamental and foundational experience of the Christian faith and its power with a human explanation of that experience. I agree that the reality of the resurrection is fundamental to Christianity. I do not think that the first century explanations of that reality is fundamental to Christian belief. I'd like to close this by, by going into something with which I close almost every lecture I give. I cannot tell you who God is. I cannot tell you what God is. No human being can do that. That's beyond the human capacity. All I can tell you is how I believe I have experienced God. That's why I was happy to hear Bill tell us how he has experienced God. Well, I've experienced God too. But I've experienced God as the source of life. And if God is the source of life, the only way I can worship this God is by living fully. And the more fully I live, the more I bear witness to this God of life. And I've experienced God as the source of love. And if God is the source of love, then the only way I can worship this God is by loving wastefully. And the more deeply and wastefully I love, the more I make this God visible. And thirdly, I experience God in the words of my great teacher, Paul Tillich, as the ground of all being. It's a cumbersome phrase. But if God is the ground of all being, I worship God by having the courage to be all that I am capable of being. And the more deeply and fully I can be who I am, then I make God visible. And to that I add this line, crucial to me, I am a Christian. By that I mean that when I look at Jesus, I see a life so totally lived that I believe I see in him the very source of life. I see a life that's so wastefully loved that I believe I see in him the source of love. I see one who has the courage to be all that he can be, whether he's being hailed as the king at Palm Sunday or crucified on Good Friday. He still is all that he can be, and so he bears witness to me of the ground of all being. And I want to be a disciple of that Jesus. But how do I follow Christ? It's not by trying to convert people to my point of view. I long ago gave that up. I follow Christ by trying to build a world where everybody in that world has a better chance to live more fully to love more wastefully and to be all that they can be in the infinite variety of our humanity, male and female, black and white, Asian, gay and straight, every kind, left-handed, right-handed, every kind of person. The call of the Christian church is to free the people of this world to be all that they can be, and the power for doing that is in the Christ figure and in the meaning of his resurrection. That, to me, is the essence of the Christian gospel, and it is upon that gospel that I stand, upon that gospel I live, and by that gospel I will die. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. And it remains only for me to conclude this evening by thanking Bethel College here at South Bend, Indiana, and the Church Communication Network for hosting us also. We've heard two very gifted and eloquent speakers tonight. I'm sure they've raised, each of them, very profound questions that we will consider in the next few minutes and weeks and months and years. And I would like you at this point to present your appreciation of our two debaters tonight, Bishop Spong and Dr. Craig. Thank you.